Chapter 5, Warriors Don't Cry, page 47. Dear Diary, The two days since I first went to Central felt like I was living in some stranger's life. Today, I won't think of integration. I won't think of Central High, and I won't think of the white people. I will spend the whole day finding the perfect disguise to wear to the wrestling matches. No matter what, I'm going to be a regular person. I'm going to have my usual date with Grandma and my secret pretend date with Vince at the matches. As hard as I tried not to care, I couldn't start my morning without knowing what the governor, his National Guard, and the school board were up to. I had to face the awful truth. Grandma was right. I was letting those people determine how I felt and how I lived a great part of my day. I brushed my hair back into a ponytail and headed for the front porch. As I picked up the newspaper, headlines leaped out at me. Halt in integration asked. Board seeks suspension of U.S. order. The Little Rock School Board was asking Judge Davies to suspend temporarily the plan for integration, integrating Central High. He would be holding a hearing on their petition on Friday, September 6th, today. As I read on, I saw the good news. Ike says he will use law. Tells Favis, cooperate with us. The federal constitution will be upheld by every legal means at my command, President Eisenhower had told Governor Faubus. The president had sent a telegram to Governor Faubus saying he was sure the governor, the National Guard, and other state officials would give full cooperation to the United States Supreme Court. The president also reassured the governor that rumors of federal authorities waiting to arrest him were untrue. I think the school board's backing off having the integration. I told my mother as she prepared to leave for school. Be patient, my mother said, heading toward the car. By the way, I'm counting on you to give your grandmother extra special help today. She's a bit weary. Oh no, I especially didn't want Grandmother India to be weary. I was counting on her to take me to the wrestling matches. For the rest of the day, I devoted myself to doing more than my share of the chores. I would do anything to keep her able-bodied and fit. As Saturday morning turned into afternoon, I was busy keeping to myself so I could apply my grown-up makeup. It was an art I had not yet acquired since I wasn't allowed to wear makeup. Even by the third try, I resembled a circus clown. But as I looked in the mirror for a final check, I was proud of the job I had done. I was a new person. Promptly at five, Grandma breezed into the front hall. She was dressed in church-going clothes, her ladies' day outfit, a blue suit with the matching hat that swooped down from its mischievous perch on the side of her head. Well, don't just stand there, child. Help me find my parasol. I couldn't help smiling. The frantic search for the umbrella was a familiar scene. It made me feel that at least some part of my life was left intact. We'd better go without it, I said. We were running late, and if we didn't hurry, the bus would leave us behind. I had been patiently waiting, hoping that at any moment my grandmother would signal her approval of my grown-up outfit, upswept hairdo, and high-heeled black patent shoes. Layers of forbidden makeup and dark glasses completed what I thought was the perfect disguise. The white people would never, ever recognize me from any picture they might have seen. Of course, my one big worry was that Grandma might say it was too grown up, but she only peered at me with a strange and lingering expression. Let's go, Grandma. We're going to be late, I said, trying to coax her towards the front door. I was praying this Vince wouldn't grow impatient waiting for me and leave, or worse yet, allow himself to be talked into spending the evening with one of the other girls. Why don't you take a seat? I'll be back in a moment, Grandma said, sounding quite strange, beckoning me to remain there in the hallway by the door. I heard her and Mama whispering in the other room. As I settled into a chair, I thought about all the earlier times when we had gone together to the wrestling match matches. Those matches were big events in my life because we traveled downtown to the Robinson Auditorium, a place usually reserved for white people only. Those were the times when I got to go outside my neighborhood, outside the world where I spent most of my life. We sat in the same room with white folks, able to observe them up close up. I wanted to get to know them better, to see what it was they had that put them in charge. Grandma India would adjust her hat, and then we would both strut down the aisle to the seats that her friend, Mr. Claxton, had saved for us. He would always be there waiting for us with the best balcony seats our people were allowed to have. 
After we got settled, I would complain about my thirst, and Grandma would grant permission for a trip to the soft drink stand. There, I would meet Vince as we planned and take him to join Grandma and Mr. Claxton, explaining that our meeting had been accidental. I had enjoyed eight evenings of double dating with Grandma and Vince, and she didn't even realize it. I knew full well my family would never have allowed me to date. They had said all along that when I was 18 and going to college, I could go out with boys, and then only in the company of a chaperone. As the evening wore on and the matches got really heated, Grandma India and I would behave as we had behaved nowhere else. She would pound the floor with her parasol and shout and wave her fists until her hat twisted on her head and her church-going outfit was rumpled. Once she had even dropped her glasses and broke them in a fit of rage when her tag team favorites, Mud Mountain and Blue Moon Hog, were counted out by the referee. When it was all over, she would revert to her quietest and most cultured tone, speaking barely above a whisper. Magnificent child, that's the way a body gets rid of aggression without misbehaving. Now, Melba, straighten yourself up, honey. Time to present ourselves as the ladies we are. Sorry, child. You can't go with me to the matches. Not tonight, said Grandma, grabbing me from my happy recollections. Maybe next time when the integration settles down. But why not? I felt tears coming, but I had promised Grandma I wouldn't cry. It's just too dangerous for you to go there amongst all those white people. They'll never recognize me. See? See? I twirled about to show her, and I was really a new person. Grandma India moved closer to me and cupped my face in her hands. You're staying home, baby. It's for your own good. Everything's been taken from me, I cried. Your grandmother's right, honey, Mother Lois. Put her arms around my waist, trying to convince me it was not the end of the world. Suppose one of those people who saw us at Central recognizes you and tries to pick a fight. What about the risk to your grandmother? I'll never go back to Central. I ran from the room and locked my bedroom door, burying my face in the pillow so no one could hear me cry. Later, I wrote in my diary, Freedom is not integration. Freedom is being able to go with Grandma to the wrestling matches. The next day, in the Sunday paper, I saw a pitiful close-up photograph of Elizabeth walking alone in front of Central on that first day of integration. It pained my insides to see, once again, the twisted, scowling white faces with open mouths jeering clustered about my friend's head like a bouquet of grotesque flowers. It was an ad paid for by a white man from a small town in Arkansas. If you live in Arkansas, the ad read, study this picture and no shame. When hate is unleashed and bigotry finds a voice, God helps us all. I felt a kind of joy and hope in the thought that one white man was willing to use his own money to call attention to the injustice we were facing. Maybe the picture would help others realize that what they were doing was hurting everybody. Seeing that ad was the beginning of a wonderful Sunday. Just before church started, Vince walked right up to me and flat out, I want to be your girlfriend, and said to me, I want you to be my girlfriend. Girlfriend, I repeated the word, desperately groping to find just the right response. I'd never been asked before. As the sermon began, I felt guilty that I didn't have my mind on prayer. Instead, I was wondering whether Vince would give me a friendship ring or the letter from his sweater. It pushed all thoughts of Central High, Governor Favis, and integration into the back of my mind. The minister was urging us to pray for Governor Favis and do whatever was necessary to heal any sour feelings we had against white people. He had been organizing other ministers in Little Rock to speak out and condemn the governor for dispatching the troops. He said we should pray for the judges and city officials and the president to make the right decision to let us into Central High. <clears throat> Suddenly, my attention was drawn to what the prayer ladies were saying. They were calling my name, asking God to protect me when I walked into the lion's den at Central. I remember what Grandma had said, church is the life's blood of our folks' community. I knew very well that without the church, the help of the people sitting around me, I had little chance of making it through that school year. <clears throat> Certainly, I couldn't count on the police. If I got into trouble and really needed protection, it would probably be the network of phone calls initiated by Reverend Young that would set off a rescue and construct a web of safety. U.S. Court summons served on Governor, Arkansas Gazette, Wednesday, September 11, 1957. A week after our first attempt to get into Central, I was still rushing to get each morning's newspaper to read about the people who'd gather daily in front of the school to see that we didn't get in. <clears throat> The president had agreed to give the governor a 10-day respite 
to sort out his response to the court order. There would be a meeting at Eisenhower's vacation spot in Rhode Island after that. The next day we learned that Representative Brooks Hayes was, would go with Governor Favis to a five-man conference that included the President, Attorney General Herbert Brownwell Jr., and Sherman Adams, Chief White House Assistant. On September 15th, the Arkansas Gazette headlines read, Favis asking compromise, Ike refuses commitment, status of troops still unanswered. Realizing that the dilemma of integration wasn't going to be resolved quickly, everybody seemed to be concerned about our failing behind in our schoolwork. Teachers from our community, along with other professionals, were offering to give us books and to tutor us. Grace Lorch, who had helped Elizabeth escape the mob and her husband, Dr. Lorch, organized tutoring sessions. It felt good to dress in school clothes and go to Philander Smith, our community's college. For part of each day, I studied schoolwork and spent time with my eight friends, enjoying a thimble full of normality. Being together in those classes, the nine of us were developing a true friendship, becoming closer knit than we might have been under other circumstances. We talked about our fears, what we missed at our old school, and our hopes that the integration issue would soon be resolved. While I regretted the friendships I was losing, I cherished the growing ties to the eight. Just before the court hearing, where Governor Favis would be called to account, the nine of us were summoned to Mrs. Bates' house to meet with the press. Nothing had changed since our last meeting. The troops were still in place around the school, and every morning the crowd of segregationists grew larger. Governor Favis was still predicting violence. Several very dignified and important-looking men sat in her living room. One was the NAACP attorney, Wiley Branton. I recognized another man whose picture I'd seen in the newspaper, the famous lawyer Thurgood Marshall, the man who had delivered the argument that resulted in the Supreme Court's 1954 school integration ruling. Judging by, <clears throat> judging by my father's height, I figured Mr. Marshall was more than six feet tall with a commanding presence, fair skin, and brown hair and mustache. He spoke like somebody on television, his sharp, quick New York accent overlaying a slight southern drawl. At the same time, we are petitioning for a court order to force your governor to move his troops away from Central's front door. We'll be planning other options. Meanwhile, we are asking that you be patient. Justice will prevail. He spoke confidently in a way that made me feel that I deserved to be admitted to Central High School. I looked at this man who seemed to have none of the fears and hesitations of my parents or of the other adults around us. Instead, he had a self-assured air about him as though he had seen the promised land and knew for certain we could get there. We, only ha we had only heard rumors of freedom, but he lived it, and it showed in every word, his every movement, in the way he sat tall in his seat. He urged us to prepare ourselves to testify in federal court, if need be. Right then and there, I began to fret about the truth I couldn't tell. If I testified in court about what really happened to me, it would get printed in the newspapers and those men would come after us again. But now I knew that, worst of all, it would give the governor yet another excuse to keep us out of school. The very basis of his argument against our integrating was that it would cause so much violence that blood would run in the streets. If I told the judge about the men having chased us, the governor could use my words as weapons against us. But as I listened to Mr. Marshall speak, I felt much better. His positive attitude gave me hope that even if I couldn't speak my truth, the scales of justice were weighing on our side. I had read that he had faced up to other Southern segregationists and forced them to let my people run for public office. He had also fought for equal rights for women. I felt honored that he would take the time and energy to fight for our rights. There was no doubt in my mind that if any soul on this earth could get us into Central High School, this great man, Thurgood Marshall, was the one. During the meeting, the upstairs had filled with a throng of new news people, most of them white, with just a sprinkling of our people. We students were directed to take our seats and to answer questions as clearly and briefly as possible. For the first time, we were introduced as the Little Rock Nine. Cameras flashed, bright lights stung my eyes, and reporters asked us lots of questions for the next half hour. Many of the reporters asked the attorneys what they planned to do to get rid of the troops, and questions were directed to Elizabeth. She seemed shy about answering, but with Mrs. Bates' help, she forced herself to say a few words. Eventually, however, questions were directed to all of us. My heart raced with fear and anticipation as I observed the process. I was almost hypnotized by the wonder of it all. Miss Patillo, how do you feel about going back to Central High? Miss, I whispered as my hands perspired and my knees shook. 
Thoughts buzzed inside my head like bees disturbed in their hive. It was the first time anybody white had ever called me miss. They cared what I thought. I struggled to find a suitable answer. We have, right, we have a right to go to that school, and I'm certain our governor, who was elected to govern all the people, will decide to do what is just. I felt myself speak aloud before I was ready. Who said that? It sounded like me, but the words, where had they come from? The white reporters wrote my words down and behaved as if what I said was very important. Pride welled up inside me, and for the first time I knew that working for integration was the right thing for me to do. Mrs. Patillo, how does a mother decide to send her daughter into such a dangerous situation? Mother Lois was sitting shy and quiet in a shadowed corner of the room. I could tell she was startled by the question. Nevertheless, she stood and said, Indeed, it is a hard decision, but we are a Christian family with absolute faith that God will protect her, no matter what. After the main session, reporters pulled each one of us students aside for what was called one-on-one -on -one interviews. Listening to all the talk about our being heroes and heroines made me proud of Mama and Grandma and all of us. I wish Grandma could tell the reporters how she stood guard. Then they would know she was a heroine, too. When the conference broke up, I lingered in a quiet corner, soaking up the sights and sounds around me. I was fascinated by the way the reporters wrote so fast in their narrow notebooks and spoke into their handheld tape recorders. The way they responded to me made me feel equal to white reporters. They looked me directly in the eye. I never saw any sign they were thinking of calling me an N. Some of them looked at me with admiring eyes and answered all my questions about their work without making me feel silly for asking. They also behaved as though they were genuine friends with the people of color among their ranks, sharing work and laughter. I felt a new fountain of hope rise up inside of me. Just maybe, I thought to myself, just maybe this is what I want to be when I grow up. If I were a news reporter, I could be in charge of a few things. That night, I wrote in my diary, Today is the first time in my life I felt equal to white people. I want more of that feeling. I'll do whatever I have to do to keep feeling equal all the time. I apologize, God, for thinking you had taken away all my normal life. Maybe you're just exchanging it for a new life. <clears throat> Hope of settlement fades as governor faces day in court. Arkansas Gazette, Thursday, September 19, 1957. The town was crowded with journalists from around the world. The federal court hearing would be one of the most significant in history. A precedent-setting decision could be made that affected the whole country. That's what all the newspaper reporters and radio announcers said over and over again. States' rights advocates from surrounding southern towns were up in arms. They were headed for Little Rock to add to the in, in, incendiary feelings in our town. The segregationists were doing a lot of newspaper advertising to get people to participate in their rallies. The Arkansas National Guard remained at Central High and hooligans rampaged through the streets. In particular, they preyed on our people walking alone in isolated areas or at night. A new level of tension crept into our own household, nearly overwhelming me. I found it difficult to study, difficult to concentrate. Some days it was as though someone had put me in Grandma's cake mixer, but I was struggling to be still, not to spin or shudder or shake. During those rare moments when I sat alone in my room among my stuffed animals, I daydreamed about Vince and what it would be like to be his ordinary girlfriend and have real dates. I'd finally gathered the nerve to ask Mother and Grandma for permission to date. After giving me what amounted to a thorough exam with really hard questions about Vince's intentions and character, Mother Lois says, have him come to the house. Her expression saddened me as she went on. Now, understand, this is not really dating, and you can only see this boy in the presence of another adult. I'm allowing you to do this because integration has taken away so much of your social life. I had a hard time containing my hallelujah shouts as I started to leave the room. But just as I reached the door, she said, of course, you'll wait to exercise this privilege until after the court hearing tomorrow. On the night before the hearing, I took Grandma's advice and let God worry about what was going to happen in that courtroom. I wrote in my diary, Dear God, we can't get along without you. Governor Favis has lots of attorneys, and the paper says they have more than 200 witnesses. I'm counting on you once and for all to make it clear whether you want me in that school. Thy will be done.